Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and I'm your host. Today I'm chatting with a super, 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 really, really, super, really, super cool person, Ali Kellner, about a lot of things. But firstly, we are going to chat about her whole pitching experience from how she created a pitch bible step by step to how she ended up winning both the Ottawa International Animation Conferences and the Toronto Arts and Animation Festival International Conferences pitch competitions to everything that's happened since and her best advice to putting together and selling your original show idea. But besides all this, Ali does a little bit of everything in the industry. She's a storyboard artist, a writer, an animator, a director, and of course, a show creator. So without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, Ali. <laughs> Thank you for coming on my animation podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing swell. How are you doing, Terry? I'm doing swell as well. I'm actually really excited to chat with you because we have very similar pitch journeys where we like both went through the exact same two Toronto Ottawa festivals and won them. And anyways, I'm super excited to chat about that. But I think let's give some for people who don't know how amazing you are. Let's give some background um, on what you do. So like you're at a family reunion and like your great aunt comes by and pinches your cheek pitches your cheek what do you say to her like you know what what are you what are you doing these days Allie for work well, well granny you wouldn't understand any of it so <laughs> no I, I that's that's an interesting question I think I would say that I work in the animation industry and I do all parts of it um I like to do the animation part I like to do the story part um directing is definitely something that I'm like trying to become or do more of and um also I think my passion lies in creating the stories before they hit the production pipeline so it's like developing bibles and shows themselves and characters and um the whole pre-production part of it so Granny. you went to animation <laughs> school right the animation schools schools Plural. but so for instance like at Sheridan they're they teach a very like uh generalist degree but they also were like you know if you want to be a rigger take all your electives in rigging did you go through schools and being like I just want to do everything and I'm not going to specialize and then because you've worked on a ton of things like you've worked on Bravest Warriors and like stuff for PBS and like Corner Gas etc cetera, etc cetera. like how do you end up I guess what I'm asking is how do you end up being able to storyboard and direct and write and animate and do all these, all of these things and not pigeon yourself into pigeonhole yourself into I'm an animator, for instance. That's a, that is such an interesting uh, question that I'm really excited to answer. I surprisingly went into Sheridan because I was at Concordia's animation program in Montreal. And I did three years there, but I didn't graduate with my bachelor's degree because I quit early and applied to Sheridan because I wanted to do more industry related stuff. I think my dream was to work at Pixar in full transparency. I think I wanted a Pixar job more than anything in the world, but that might have been because I didn't know anything else existed. And that Pixar was to me with like the holy grail. I would watch the shorts like every day. Um, so I thought, okay, Concordia is not going to get me at Pixar. I, they're not teaching me anything like animation wise that I really need to know. I mean, I don't know, maybe they were, and I wasn't learning anything, but anyway, I thought I had to go to Sheridan. So at Sheridan, I got in and realized I really wasn't as good of an artist as I thought I was. And, uh, kind of just realized then and there that to get to the point of being at Pixar, the amount of work I would have to do as an artist in one specific thing just sounded horrible. Like, you mean like to be a really great or like, animator. Or like Sorry? CG, you mean like storyboarding or like CG animating? Like anything like, yeah, CG animating was really fun for me, but like to be a really good CG animator, you gotta like just do it a lot and like just constantly just focus on your passion as CG animator. And I was like, that's not what I'm passionate about. And I think it was in third year where I got to go to Six Point Harness as an intern and there I spoke to Wendy and Brendan, they um, run the place and they did, they let us do this, you know, pitching seminar thing where they kind of taught us what it means to pitch and what it means to create stories and, and, and how to create a good pitch. And I think at that moment I was like, oh, I want to make the stories. That's why I don't have any passion about any like very specific artistic 
thing. I'll do it because it, it means creating the story as a whole. I can be a part of it, but ultimately I want to tell the stories. And sometimes I'm like, why didn't I go into writing? Um, because that at some point I realize is where all the stories come from. But anyway, I'm getting there. Um, but yeah, I was at Six Point Harness where I was like, okay, I want to make the stories. And then I made my film and I was able to tell a story from beginning to end. And I was able to do all parts of the animation production pipeline. So I was animating backgrounds, layout, storyboarding, editing. Like I loved every single part of the process of putting together this film where I was like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself. I want to do it all. I, I love waking up every day if I have a project that allows me to just sit at my computer and then just do what I want to create yeah. more than anything, I think. Wow, that's incredible. I should be a filmmaker is what we're saying. <laughs> I mean, I, I love that because, you know, there's a lot of pressure to do just one thing. And there's a lot of pressure to just get a stable job in any industry. Mm -hmm. And in animation, there's I feel like there's even more pressure because it's like such a hard industry to get into and stay in. But to, to be honest with yourself and be like, I... I actually want to do all parts of the process. That's like scary and amazing. So like, you know, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, tell me how you went from that realization to actually making a living somehow doing all <laughs> parts of this, you know, because there's, there's a lot of steps in between and unknowns and like, where am I going to go from here? Um, but a funny anecdote I have to say is um, when I was in fourth year, at Sheridan having the time of my life. I woke up at like 7 a.m., went to the gym and then got to the studio before anybody else was even awake, like working on my film, but like loving it. And so having the time of my life. And then I was speaking to another student and I said, hey, aren't you having a really great time doing this filmmaking thing? Like, aren't you enjoying it? And she was like, are you serious? This sucks. I just want to like be an animator. I just want someone to tell me what to do every day. Like, I don't yeah. want to be a part of any of this. And that's when I was like, okay, so I'm not the only, like, sorry, I am one of the only people in this room who really, really enjoy the full yeah. storytelling process of it. And there are people out there, and, I, and I'll never forget this, there are, are people out there who are just like, tell me what to do, and I'll sit at my desk, and I'll animate, because I freaking love animation, and I'll do that, and I'll be happy. And I was like, if I did that, I would die. <laughs> like, I just could not, I can't do it. Totally, <laughs> totally. I, so, so I don't remember what your question was. <laughs> no, but I, I love that you just said that because like, you know, especially by fourth year, you know what you want to do. You know, you want to be a viz dev artist and then you're forced to make a whole film and animate like you don't want to animate. But like you, like you said, like I said before, you just found out that you just loved all parts of the process. So how did you go from, you know, being like, I want to do everything to right. then being able to support yourself doing that? Because that's that's also tough because a, a company a studio isn't going to hire somebody who's going to do a storyboarding one week and then animate the next week. They're going to be like, I want just an animator and I just want a storyboarder. I don't want like somebody who can do everything. So where did, where is, do you go from yeah, that? That's exactly it. And so funny that you say that because I feel like when I was at school, I was told, no, you should be a generalist because if you get to a studio and they need you to do this, you, you can, you can hop on and do story. And now like how many years later that I'm in the industry, I was like, that's never happened i've never been in a studio where there's been someone who's like i'm gonna just pop over to boards now from animation <laughs> yeah, i don't know have you <laughs> no <laughs> so yeah so i think um I've, I've done the jobs where i've had contracts like i just finished up a contract this summer as a storyboard revisionist on some preschool show in toronto and you know paid the bills and i was learning how to draw again which was interesting and how do you i did even, how do you even get that job when you have such a plethora of skills? Like what, why, oh, wouldn't this, why wouldn't this place be like, I want somebody who's a master storyboard revisionist storyboarder, mm -hmm. not to say that you don't have great skills, but you just told me you had to learn how to draw again, but also that you do all, all, the, all the things in the process. So how, how did you end up getting that, that role? Uh, I think they I think they were really desperate. Oh no. <laughs> okay, so my strategy coming out of school was to find really desperate. Find the desperate ones. You know what? Don't find the desperate ones because they might not treat you very well. But anyway, um, I so what happened was I was so lucky that I was given the chance to and storyboard on Corner Gaz. I don't know how I landed that job, but I think someone I knew knew someone who was 
directing and they put me in front of him and he said, here's your test. And I did the test and it wasn't easy, but I just like faked it. And then they're like, oh yeah, that's what the show is supposed to look like. You can have a job as a storyboard artist. And I was like, damn, I've never even been a story revisionist. So better pretend like, you know what you're doing. And I did that for a year Wow. and it was fun. And I learned how to storyboard. So I don't know. I, I also felt really grateful to get the job as Bravest Warriors animator and learned how to animate really truly with rigs because um, someone just said, seems like you know a little bit about what you're doing. Try this. And I so just you're, felt- you're applying for a lot of different jobs though to get these. Like yeah, you saw, the, I got you saw as- the application for Bravest Warriors and you're like, I can rig, I guess I'll apply. Um, how did I get Bravest? I think they got me from no, I applied. I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering, like, you know, when you want to do a little bit of everything, how do you end up building a career that does a little right. bit of everything? And I'm, I'm assuming, you know, once the ball's rolling and you have more experience in every area, it gets easier and connections, et cetera. And they're like, well, oh, we'll bring an alley. Not really. I, I think, first of all, it's terrifying to think that for the rest of my life, I have to stay relevant and continuously keep contact don't you feel that way like you're just oh yeah I'm terrified you can't take you can't take time off like you know if I were to take a year off and drop off the face of the earth which is what COVID kind of felt like but everyone went through the same thing it's terrifying because then it's like you have you know 500,000 students that just graduated who are probably aces better than you are who can take your potential job at any point so am I making a mistake not working my way up in industry and focusing on one specific skill set but do you know. think, do you think also, because also an, another thing I've been thinking about and I've chatted with other people as well is that those 500,000 students, they are not developing their own unique voice and style. They're doing what the industry wants. Like the industry wants 500,000 rigged animators. They're jumping onto shows versus like, if you focus on, you tell me how this has worked out for you. If you focus yeah, on developing your own your question. <laughs> voice and style, then like, it doesn't matter because a company will be like, we want a uh, fresh whatever take and oh Ali's like figured out this amazing cute great style let's bring her in versus these 500 out <laughs> 100,000 other students like I don't know you tell me yeah no I've never been brought in like that I think I was so the one job that has given me the freedom to do exactly what I wanted and um, just had all the faith in me was also a fluke where I graduated with my film at Sheridan, my thesis film. And um, Peter Hannon, the producer, uh, reaches out to me and he's like, hey, I saw your film. You have a really great style. Do you wanna do some shorts? We're looking for Ontario animators. And um, then I didn't stop working on that show on and off since 2017. So- That's crazy. Wow. I've done like, So they did 90 second interstitials for the show, which the best thing to happen to animation, I think in Ontario, because it gave so many artists the chance to just make shorts in their style they wanted to make. And Peter is a damn angel who came to Ontario and was like, all you amazing artists, here's a short, here's a short, here's a short, make something. And I had the opportunity to work with my husband and we made some really great things together and I just woke up with like a spring in my step every day and I was like I get to work on my own short and Peter Hannon is behind me and I'm loving this and if there's more of that then how many did you uh, oh I I I also got to work on some I made four and they uh, same thing loved every moment of it Peter Hannon is amazing I got to create whatever I wanted etc etc how many did you end up making oh my god uh hold on Four, five, six, seven. Wow. Something like that. Yeah. That's crazy. So okay, so I guess we're we're like just chatting about how to create a career in uh random art in the animation industry. Yeah. So like yeah. So going forward, your kind of strategy is like I need to stay relevant and grind like you know I actually I I think that's what that's what I should be thinking I should stay relevant and grind but um I don't (laughs) and I think something and I'm really glad that I'm on this podcast actually at this very moment because I have to say that the pressure for animation artists or animators or storyboard artists 
to produce work on top of the work that they produce for eight hours a day is ridiculous. I think two years ago, I just stopped carrying a sketchbook around with me to make me feel guilty because I was not pulling it out at cafes and sketching people because I was like, why am I going to carry this thing around like a brick in my bag to make me feel so damn guilty that I'm not sitting at this coffee shop and working? Like it's not, it wasn't fun for me because some people I think maybe find it fun. But for me, it was like every drawing that came out just felt like it was like, no, this has to be great because I get to put this on Instagram and make sure that people know that I'm still relevant. And I was like, no, like, I don't want that pressure anymore. So I stopped carrying the sketchbook and I instantly felt less guilty and um, more relaxed. Yeah. And then I think I just stopped, like, I just feel like sometimes animation and art can just be like a means to an end where, I don't know, maybe I'm going to be ostracized for saying this, but like I produce work and I, and whenever I want to, I do draw and I will do my own stuff when I want to. But for the most part, it's the telling the stories part of it that excites me. And I'll work on the things that I'm passionate about and that's storytelling. So I'll spend my evenings and weekends writing character arcs and new stories and plots and synopsises and episode ideas and putting together pitch packages and calling people to pitch to them because that's the stuff that I'm passionate about. But my bread and butter is the animation industry. And if you ask me how I can put together a career where I'm mix and matching different parts of the process, I could not give you a right answer because I just feel like it's all just happened. What you just said is really interesting to me because it sounds like you just have a passion in your mind that the animation industry happens to line up in some aspects. And then there's, you know, like, you're just like, I want to tell cute, amazing, cool stories. And that's what I want to do. But there's this industry telling me that that passion I have is actually in this box called animation illustration that I have to like perfect and perform at. And the people who like, are like genius animators, they're like setting the standard being like, you need to wake up at 6 a.m., go to a coffee shop, get your coffee there, draw everybody, then go to work, then come home and like work on a storyboard for your short film. Like, because those people are phenomenal and amazing, but Absolutely. you know, no the hate anim- on them. They, they fit are- so well into the animation mold. They're like, they're like, that's their thing. But there's right. no, there's no industry set around like being a generalist storyteller, really. You have to, you have there to take isn't. your passion and put it into either like children's books. Uh, yeah, or which novels, would be great. I would do that. or like, yeah, or like, or animation, or live action. Like, you have to kind of piece yourself and form yourself into the box of these different industries. I guess. I, and, and and you know, you're right. But I, I have to put it out there that I'm not saying that what they're doing is wrong. No, I not at all. Not if at all. You could wake up at six a.m., sketch people, go to work, come home, storyboard, and plan air paint on the weekends. Like, like snaps for you I wish I was you I wish I could do that but no, but no you think... don't because you just told me you're doing that anyway it's just in a different it's true setting. it's true you're I don't home I don't. and show pitches on your side yeah which other people find it super which other exhausting. people don't absolutely yeah I think yeah that's it and I, and I do stuff that I'm passionate about on the side it's just not you know physically drawing on my iPad or Cintiq every single day what if okay and, so there I've talked to a couple of people in Europe where they have artist collectives, where it's like, it's like 10 directors uh, all work together in a studio and whoever's grant or funding or project takes off, they all jump off and make that film together. And I moved to Europe. That sounds like a- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which kind of sounds, it sounds super interesting. So it's like, you know, uh, say director A is not Ali, um, their film gets funding and suddenly you're storyboarding for this film and animating or like director B needs a yes, Terry, do you want to start this? Like whatever. Yeah, yeah let's, too. why doesn't that exist here? Like we have Canadian no. funding grants, stuff don't like- Not really though. Do not, we, we yeah, have, you're right. <laughs> the amount of funding in Europe just supersedes, I think, Canadian. I could, I could be wrong, but from what I've seen, I mean, I had every intention before I got married this September to put together an application for a film, a film grant. I got into the Canadian Media Fund or can, not Media Fund, the Canada Arts Council. Yeah. I like got my application approved and then I was going to write this whole grant application and then life happened. Um, but I still want to make another film. I still, you know, I, I, that's the stuff that I like feel like 
doesn't die is the is the wanting to tell more stories totally. wanting to make work but just not like like practicing hands or like the way your shoulder connects or yeah. like making sure that you get character expressions down like that stuff is great and I kind of wish I had that in the back of my mind and I definitely do need to work on that if I want to continue as an animator or anything like that but I just um, but it's not think, your thing and that's that's 100% okay yeah and, and I just hope that there's a space for people to say that without feeling like people will be like oh well then you know can you be in it like can you be in like are you allowed to be in this industry because I feel like there is a whole world of directors and filmmakers out there doing great, cool shit who aren't necessarily like Sheridan graduate life drawing experts, you yeah. know, like their work is crazy awesome. And I'm sure they do a lot of art every day and I'm sure they, they kill it every day, but. Um, well, I think, I I think there definitely there. is a space. Like I, I get what you're saying. And like, I even feel I'm embarrassed in my own path in a weird way because like I would I like put off stop motion I was like I'm not going to stop motion and I have to because I also like writing I like doing everything too and then um you know when you go to Sheridan I feel like a lot of people like doing a lot of things and then the pressure of getting a job uh and fitting into what a studio wants like kind of takes over especially you know you're young you don't have a lot of money blah 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 and so um like what you're saying with I, I'm losing my train of thought. Yeah, but I feel just like the that. nature of going to school and being in a community of a ton of people who all have like different aspirations and then going through this experience together and all feeling the pressure to get a job and like fit into the place. I think it does kind of kill a little bit of that in a lot of people. Like I've chatted with a lot of people on this podcast where they, you know, they're working in a studio during the day, but they would love to make and do other stuff on the side, but they just feel exhausted at the end of the day from working that and they just don't. You know, like, I just, I don't understand. I, I feel like I have such a passion for other things. Like I love cooking and I'm not, I'm not just like, you know, frying eggs, like really putting together like gourmet meals. I, I really, truly love spending my time cooking, baking. Like, I think I want to start like a baking business maybe. Like I have a vegetable garden that I spend time in and, I, and it's basic stuff that I feel like people in other industries just do. Whereas people in animation, it's like, well, oh. no, like you're cheating on your animation. You, yeah, like... you should be working on your other shit. Like, I don't even remember the last time I think, well, I read books now, but when I was, you know, with this whole headspace, I think I wasn't reading for fun because I kept thinking everything I read has to be focused towards how to be a better artist yeah. or how, and, and maybe, maybe I don't have good time management and I can ask the case and other people can call in and be like, Carrie, like Ali said this, but actually it's possible to do it all. So I don't know what she's smoking, but. Well, some people, like, for instance, I've, I've talked with people on this podcast who go home and watch a new film every day and like analyze it, like as their homework and they're like storyboard artists or whatnot, but like. Okay, you know, but they're like passionate about board art. Super passionate. But if you're not enjoying it, like why right. you're not mm -hmm. learning, you're just, you're decreasing your own mental health. But I totally, I totally get that myself because like something that I think about a lot is like, you know, maybe my path is to just make short films or something like that. But then how am I getting paid? Like, what if I have a side business so that isn't animation? And I'm like, that feels wrong. It needs to be animation. It can't be like, I have a side business that fuels my animation desires. Cause then it just feels, it doesn't feel right, I guess. So, okay. <laughs> so um, you realized earlier on in your career or school, whatever, that you love creating the before production of a show so you're like i i love doing this i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna do it with such passion that i'm actually gonna put it out into the world and try to make it happen so tell me tell me about you know putting together a pitch and deciding you want to actually take it seriously and get it sold uh yeah that's an interesting path too so i started like i said at six point where they taught me kind of the bare bones of what it means to tell a story and i think one of the main things they said was write what you know and I, and I remember going home and thinking, right, what you know, well, what do I know? I'm just this Jewish girl from a Jewish suburb and, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, like what wait do a I, I had a very nice life. I didn't have any trouble. Right, what you know, like, I don't, what am I going to say? So, so it was really hard because I feel like I took that really literally. And then later on, I learned that storytelling could, could be like a cool story that you want to tell that doesn't necessarily have to do with your personal life 
but yeah. it should connect to why you should tell this story. What's your perspective on it? So as a Jewish woman, what would my perspective be? Like a 30 year old woman, what would my perspective be? So, um, you know, and then scale that down for ages six to 11. So anyway, so when I was in LA, I came up with this show called Gold, which is about uh, a family where the mother is, uh, has been possessed by an alien demon for like 30 odd years. And he lives on his own planet, but he controls her through whatever. And she's almost like a demon figure when he activates her. Anyway, it's really complicated and I really need to work on it. But I was like, okay, well, sometimes I feel like my mom and I didn't get along. And, you know, that was like a starting jumping off point. So what could that look like? And then my father was always reading and watching TV. So what would that look like in a character? And, you know, what, how does my brother fit in? And just you know, being able to bring characters from your own life into your show really helps push your, your writing. And then um, after I decided that that's an idea that I can't really work anymore, I came up with a show that I wanted to pitch as my fourth year film. And in the end, a great guy called Rex um, helped me pick my thesis film, which was about my grandmother's experience in the war. So in the end, I didn't pick that show idea, but I, but I really liked that idea not the war one that I finished, but the other idea about school that was in my head. And so I said, okay, well, I still want to make this, I, you know, even though I'm making a film about my grandmother in the war, I still want to make this thing about Mel about school. So I wrote it out and I put together a, a short synopsis and I drew all the characters and I talked about who these characters are. And um, when I was working at Portfolio on Bravest Warriors, I made friends with the sales and development team and they said, well, do you have a show? And I said, yes. And then they gave me a lot of good feedback and it changed it completely. And then it changed again another 20, 30 times. What was, what was some of the feedback? So what did you show them? You showed them like the synopsis with character yeah. drawings? Yeah. And then so what was their reason, feedback? I, oh my God. We, well, first of all, they wanted to work with it, but they wanted me to change a whole bunch of stuff. I think yeah. it was like, give the character some sci-fi friend and then like some robot friend, I think. And, then... and you're like, but this is a children's school in real world. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know. I think my tagline for it from the very beginning was recess for the 21st century because I'm such a millennial mm. and I can't get over the 90s. Yeah. And I was like, I need to redo the 90s TV for kids these days. And how do I give it a 21st century twist? So I called my show recess for the 21st century and I had all my squads, all of my... Um, my clicks in, in the school. And I called it Melrose Middle School because I grew up on Melrose Street in Montreal. And I was five minutes away from my elementary school, which was the basis of my experience already. in sixth grade. Um, so I came up with the show. I said, okay, well, what if I base it on Royal Vale and um, this, this school I went to? And I never had middle school, but whatever, Melrose Middle School sounded great. And they liked it, but they changed it so much that I was like, I don't even know what the show is anymore and then they said okay well we don't want it anyway so then uh i said okay i need a real writing friend so i called my friend a uh, friend of a friend david uh who's now my writing partner for a few years and he's an actual comedy writer director um so with his help we were able to flesh out what a good story is what this story means i i kept the trueness of the melrose middle school recess for the 21st century and the characters stayed the same but he really helped build like how to tell, pro like, like when you're writing an episode, what are you trying to say in that episode? What's the conflict? How does it, what's the arc of it? Um, and then stuff like that. When you like say technical. you kept it true to yourself or what it was, what does that mean? Uh, just the, the, I think it just stayed with the, I think what we did was we took out all of the shit that made it taking away from the essence of the show. I think we went back down to the essence of the show, which was recess for the 21st century, kids in school, dealing with the traumas of living life as a middle schooler, because I think Big Mouth had come out at some point and I was like, oh my God, that's my show, but an adult show. So yeah. Big Mouth for kids. Um, and then I said, um, let's figure out who these characters are. So we really started going into the relationships between the three mains and I started to have a real feeling of who they were. And uh, yeah, David just really helped flesh it from the beginning. And we just took out all this stuff that was just flash, you know, mm -hmm. like sci-fi stuff and the magic stuff and like all this stuff that had happened over the years. And we just 
took it away and we said, what's the show about? It's about kids living life. And let's mirror that to kids today. And then I pitched it at Ottawa and we won. Wait, wait, but <laughs> it sounds like it became easier to pitch once all that fluff and flash was out. So, okay, yeah. so you pitched it at Ottawa. What did yeah. you have at the end? Like, you know, you had some episodes, you had the yes. art. Okay, so what did you how what did you pitch to Ottawa? Um, Ottawa's uh, Ottawa meet, Nate needs you to put together a pitch package. I don't remember exactly, but they said, "What's your show?" So you got to have the title, the logline, the synopsis. Well, actually, I don't know if they required any of that, but I think I had the title, logline, the synopsis. Yeah. Then I had, I think I had a lot more than a lot of people would have had. So I had. Um, Oh yeah, the audience, the information, and all that kind of stuff. Character yeah. one, character two, character three. So, so pretty, Mac, pretty basic stuff. Like they're not. I mean, I also went through this experience. Oh yeah, here, so. you would know. What I put together like a, a one and a half PDF page just with like silly drawings and like. Oh, words. I did a twelve page <laughs> PDF package. <laughs> I had like six episodes. I had uh, secondary characters. Um, wow. Yeah. No, but I you know it. what? Honestly. Props to Brandon Lane, who, who came in when we got accepted to the pitch, he came in as our mentor and really helped us flesh out character traits and character flaws. And totally. he really helped us with, with kind of the backbone stuff. But I have to say, I think our presentation nailed it. Yeah. Is your pitch package is your 12 page Bible written about what the show's about, who the characters are, and what your episodes are. And your presentation, I actually just talked about this today in class, your presentation is kind of your pitch package, but broken down and digestible for an audience or for your, your execs. So um, what we used a lot of GIFs, GIFs, I really GIFs, went hard. I, GIFs. I know it's annoying. I never, I know. GIFs. And I thought, you know, I love communicating in GIFs. I don't care how millennial I look. That's what I do. I, yeah. When I when reaction to something, it's a gif, gif, and <laughs> and so I said, okay, let's just use what we love because David and I both communicate in gifs to each other. So we put it like gifs on every page of our presentation, and we used gifs to kind of like like when we pitched our episodes, we used a gif to be like, this is a gif representing this episode. This is a gif representing this character. This is a gif representing the style of the show, the humor of the show, and I, I think that. something else that we did um, was that we said, it's got like the, the style of recess with the situational comedy of um, gumball with the, um, you know, uh, I don't remember exactly what we said, but like with essence of Big Mouth and like, we really just took a bunch of different shows that were already out there and we're like, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and you have our show. And- You weren't worried that you were like diluting like and confusing people to be like, how does Big Mouth fit in with recess, fit in with like whatever? Oh, I think, yeah, I think that was an, I, I never thought about about that. I, I was told once you shouldn't compare your show to anything else on the market um, because you're pigeonholing yourself and they said, well, that show already exists. But I don't know. I feel like if you can slip it in that your show has the a specific part of another show, like the humor of Bob's Burgers or the, the blueness of Rick and Morty yeah. or. Um, hey, I, I am agreeing with you. I think if you feel confident that at this, this explains perfectly what you're going for, then do it. Right. And even like, you know, you get all this advice, like you need to have a 12 or I don't know, a 10 page pitch. You need to have a character slide. You need to have all this writing and both. Like, I think what you did is amazing. You were like, no, I'm going to tell this how I most effectively communicate the ideas and people will get it because, you know, you're not putting yourself in this like potentially dry format where you're not feeling comfortable and you're trying to like explain things in a way that's not how you would naturally communicate so I love that you yeah. like you did you did gifs and for like for my presentation I drew all the I drew the entire pitch as a as a kid's storybook with no words and I just told the stories and like that yeah. that worked like I didn't have any like breakdown character page at all like well, so it's a preschool show right yeah and also you know it was much more simplified than a middle school's it was like, here's a wizard. He's got some ducks. Like, this is the show. 
So okay, yeah, so I think you, you hit you hit a good nail on the head there. But yeah. So you're so you're at Ottawa and you're like you're like presenting in front of every. It's a competition, right? Like, did you did you see the other ones presented and like you know like did you? How was that whole experience? Did you know that you were going to come out ahead? Were you? Yeah, that's nervous? so funny. Um, yes, we saw everybody else's, and David and I, when we're together, we're just ridiculous. And I think we became friends with Azarin, the festival, uh, one of the producers or directors. I don't remember what her title was, but she's amazing. And <laughs> we kept we kept passing by her after we all pitched, and we'd be like, Azarin, what's going on? She's like, you guys are doing good. And <laughs> <laughs> and she was awesome I think it was just a really fun experience honestly if we hadn't won but when we found out that we made top two I think it was like a moment of like because because David and I practiced that pitch so many times and yeah. I'm someone who really hates doing anything more than once I think that's one of the reasons why I hate like working in studios for so long because I think after like a certain amount of time and just like I'm let's move on to something else please um and like that's how I feel with, with practicing pitches because it's like okay I did it once like I'm fine like let's just do yeah, it and David's yeah. like no I don't trust you at all when you start talking you don't stop talking and you're going to talk for five minutes and I'm not going to say anything and then you're going to fuck up the whole thing yeah, so he's like no like, we need to practice you only have like six to ten minutes or something to pitch the whole thing <laughs> so one of the most important things that I think David taught me is just have the patience to practice so we would just like sneak off to like empty rooms in the hotel of the chateau whatever and before our pitch we just like practiced 20 times and we timed ourselves we're like how can we get this down to like the 10 minute mark and uh, we had our cue cards and um yeah practice just oh yeah I think that's so important did you like, practice you practiced you must have oh practiced. I, I practiced like probably a hundred times like oh. because I remember I remember the first time uh, my brother, I was messaging him. I'm, I was like, I think I'm done. Like, I'm ready to go. And he's like, have you practiced it and timed yourself? And, and I was like, no, I'll do that next. And he's like, call me right now and give me your pitch. So I called him and realized how rusty I was. I didn't know what I was saying. I was I going off on you. tangents and I wasn't even, uh, and he like gave me some super great feedback. He's like, I really think that this one thing you said was really great and important, but this other stuff, you don't even need, need to say that. Like, whatever. If somebody wants to ask you about it later, then go for it. So like, yeah, practicing. I was like practicing up until mine was all online, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. Oh, but, but was, you know what though? Advantage because you can keep your whole script right there. Oh, oh, right? I didn't. Yeah, yeah. But also you can just sit down. Like before my presentation, I was literally pacing and sweating so badly and like shaking. I was so nervous. And then I sat down and it was fine. And I like yeah. just went through it. But yeah, um, that's why practice, practice is important so too. Important. Yeah. If I didn't because practice, I probably would have just, you know, like choked up and failed. Oh, 100%. <laughs> it's, it's not even practicing to like make sure that you get it on time. It's like, because if you do it, oh my God, sorry. Leo, you're so loud. Come here. Um, hey, it's a dog. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so that when you get your nervous, when you're nervous, you just know what you practice. So you can just rely on your on your practice. But what I wanted to say was, um, speaking of practicing, I didn't know before I met David, like how important it was. So I went up in front of Frederator and I did an online a virtual pitch to Frederator in 2017 or 2018. Yeah. And it was the worst thing what that's happened? ever happened. Why? I didn't practice. I yeah, didn't but what, what went wrong? Like, uh, I just, I think I started talking and in my head, I knew what the show was about. But when you start to try to explain it to someone from scratch, she just, I just went off on tangents. Like, I said, okay, well. <laughs> your dog is just trying to lick your face right now she's he's like sorry my, sorry, time. my dog is getting into my personal space and he doesn't understand that my face is off limits um yeah no I just didn't practice it and so I went off on tangents and I think I talked for 15 or 17 minutes and that's way too long at the end they still yeah that's way too long and they still didn't know what I was talking about and they were so nice about it they were like yeah like you know, you still have some work to do. So like when you know, when you've refined it, please let us know. And I think when I closed the window, I just cried so hard. But it's, I almost it feel the, like you need some of those experiences to understand the importance yeah. of putting something together. Because the other thing is like, you know, um, what I've understood too is I can have a whole world, characters, everything going on in my head and dra drawn out. But like to explain this in five minutes to somebody and if they don't, if you don't explain the right things, they're totally not interested because you can like 
you know, like the, one of the worst mistakes is to just go off world building forever and be like, and then there'll be like an yeah. elf village and the elf village will like specialize so in like water magic. And it's like, yeah. I don't care. Tell me the, tell me the heart of the story. Like, yeah. why, why does this show exist? So, but even if you don't have that confidence in selling yourself, like you're half the pitch is just who you are. Like, you know, and that's like, why it's so tough to hear. Not not hard to hear rejections because of course it's part of the game but sometimes like especially with Melrose when you put your whole being on like Melrose is me that's I didn't yeah. want to give up on it I feel like I started it in 2016 and I just really felt like it was something that needs to be on tv and then David felt the same way thank god and I didn't give up on it and it's a part of me it's not necessarily like the show isn't about me but yeah so tell me what happened after Ottawa. You won the festival and oh, then, yeah. um, you know, did that put you on a platform? Did suddenly uh, tons of studios want to talk to you? Like, cause, cause my, my experience with Ottawa was also like, suddenly I had some proof to be like, Hey, I won a pitch competition in Canada. Give me uh, your time of day studio X, Y, Z. So it helped me a little bit get more meetings and um, like talk to more people. Did that happen with you? Yeah, I got a ton of meetings, um, a ton of meetings that seemed like they were gonna do really well and yeah. then I heard from them again. So that's the name of the game. But yeah, I think I got a lot of offers, not offers, I got a lot of interviews. Um, but I think um, in the end, it was uh, the studio in Toronto that really, like stuck with us from the beginning and this is so insane i like how my camera view is my just the dog now <laughs> my dog's entire body is blocking the camera um yeah in the end uh, i went with the studio in toronto because uh one of the guys who's producing there um he's an amazing guy and uh i really felt connected to him and i was really hoping if he's on my project we could do no wrong yeah and um, it's not like I was fighting off contracts, though. So let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, but let's also be honest, like to get uh, studio involvement is pretty rare because like yeah. I've talked to a lot of producers and they'll be like, I get at least one new pitch every single day of the year. And it's that's like, wild. yeah, it's wild. They get hundreds of pitches and that's they're just like, I'm just one of the producers at this studio. So like we all get this amount and we have like a quarterly review where we all bring like uh we bring 25 as a team and pick one where you may be interested in so it's like you know if every studio is getting hundreds of pitches every year and they might be interested in one if they even bother like the fact that you got something picked up is incredible okay so let me another weird topic that i, I want to talk about maybe we talk about without going into specifics which i also had a hard time with when i um you know was looking into development for silly duck wizard was finding a freaking lawyer because, you know, uh, hi, I'm fresh to the industry. I don't know anything. And suddenly I need to know about my rights, merchandising, percentages, like all these crazy terms that w I can't just like look up on Wikipedia and be like, what do I need to know as a show creator? Like this doesn't exist. Like there's no courses. You Like if I didn't have my mentor from the Ottawa Animation Festival, Julie Stewart, who is absolutely phenomenal and helping me out, I would have no idea where to start. So like, tell me about how your whole experience with like figuring out rights and how, where to find a lawyer and what is important when like if say like so I'm listening to this right now and I've been pitching and I'm like I have an option agreement in hand what is my next step that I should do um it's tough because I think everyone goes for lawyer um makes sense I with Ottawa won a lawyer uh <laughs> I want a, a lawyer man <laughs> <laughs> this lawyer man is now yours <laughs> he belongs to me. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> <laughs> and go sit there while I until I need you. Uh, no, we only got a few hours of uh, free uh, lawyering uh, from this guy, but um, Edwards Creative is amazing. They're Ottawa based, and I didn't have to look for a lawyer because um, I was gifted one. But mm. it only went so far because I think it took more than the few hours that we had for free. So, pretty expensive. I don't think I made any money out of my option agreement. Actually, I know I didn't make any money out of my option agreement because of the lawyer fees. But um, what I would say is that if you are interested in pitching and writing, you should put together scripts and get those scripts nicely ready with your pitch packages and all of your 
people who are interested in buying your show, go to an agent, mm. get your agent to then negotiate on your behalf because your agent gonna... won't charge you until the thing is done. And they'll argue for you. Your lawyer's like, my lawyer was really great. He was arguing for us. He was like trying to get us the best deal. But in the end, like he gets paid by the hour. So to him, he's like, well, you want to hop on another half hour call with me to figure out what this means? No problem. I'll charge right. you, but I'll explain to you what merchandising rights are. And, uh, and I think an agent or a manager would sit down and be like, um, this is this, this is this, this is this. And like, you know, good luck. Looking back in this experience, have you created a new pitch? Like you've gone through the whole process all over again? Yeah. So I love coming up with, I love coming up with shows. I have to say that I think in the last few months, I think since this earlier this year, like my drive has plummeted and I call it my COVID depression times, but <laughs> Listen, before you also got married and had to plan a whole wedding. So I did be- plan a whole wedding this year. So there's that, but I don't know. I feel like I got pretty burned out. So, um, well, I was just going to um, ask you if you want to talk about that too. I was just going to ask you like, how did you streamline the whole process for yourself? after everything you learned how, how streamline it now every yeah, day because good. creating a, a pitch from scratch like were you just oh, like okay. let's start with the heart let's create a script right away oh like, how to create a show a show here's the magic thumb <laughs> no <laughs> no actually i actually have another show that i'm really excited about i pitched it to taffy remember last year and i won uh, yeah. taffy 2020. oh it's a new a different show yeah different show oh my goodness so i didn't actually it's watch prolific. the taffy pitches <laughs> i'm so sorry i thought i thought you won it with the same show but you won it with a different show that's incredible so two yeah. shows you've created have both yeah. been highly uh competitive winning <laughs> things at the two biggest festivals in canada yeah i mean amazing <laughs> that's so no, cool. I, i'm really excited about that show i think um i came up with it when i was living in um Toronto in the East End I was walking past I don't know if anyone knows this but it is like by Danforth there's like um the whole subway network yeah it was like a whole subway hub anyway um my husband now at the time Beyonce was like oh like we were both like I wonder what happens in the subway hub it just seems like it goes on forever it was this huge huge place and I was like what if it was like a giant like lost and found and then I don't know, he like said some things. And then I like went on a tangent where I was like, oh, lost and found where the, the inside is endless and anything can be found. And then I just like came up with the entire show on our 15 minute walk with my dog. And then I called my friend, David, a uh, writer friend. And I was like, David, I have a show. And he's like, whatever you have, I'm in it. And, <laughs> and, and then, and then we just like kind of in like two months hacked out lost and found, submitted wow. to Taffy. Oh my gosh. Got I wanted to Taffy. I- can you, I want to take a look at this. Is this available online anywhere? Yeah, it's on my website. Oh, it's on your website. website. All of my pitches are on my website. I only have three official ones right now, but I think um, if you want to get like the full scope, you have to email me for the PDF package. Um, Lost and found, actually, I reached out to Fred Siebert, uh, Frederator. Yeah. And I pitched to him and his his colleagues and he's incredible. And he was like, oh my God, like this show is, because at first I didn't know if it was a teen show or an adult show. And he like, he just really helped us figure out like it's an adult show and it definitely has legs. And he was so enthusiastic about it that I'm like, oh my God, Fred Siebert, please like, let's, let's keep talking. But then he said he wanted to see a script, which I was like, of course you do. Like, that makes sense. Uh, I'll write that script for you. And then now it's, October and the script is halfway done. <laughs> it okay. takes time to do your passion projects. Yeah, totally. hundred percent. Like that's, but fine. I really hope he's still interested. I, do. I love that you pitch him. I've been like, you know how, the, like, I don't know if you, I, I don't know what kind of sentiment I'm trying to say, but you know how you like really want to pitch somebody, but you're like too scared to even do it. So you just never, no, do I it. don't have that. No, I don't have oh, that feeling. Fred, Sorry. Fred is like, we're that very funny. different in that way. Fred, that I, I pitch you? everybody but Fred because I'm like, Aww. I'm like made this, I have this one pitch that I just finished up this last month and I like made it with him in mind the entire time. And I, I'm like, I'm like, I know I need to pitch this, but I'm going to delay it as long as possible and pitch it to everybody else until everybody says no. And Aww. then I'll pitch Fred. <laughs> Is it because he might reject you and then you might feel like completely ripped And I'll apart. be like, no. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm going to quit animation. Yeah, this is this is my villain story. <laughs> well, I, I pitched a Frederator, like I said, in 20 whatever. Yeah. He was like, I remember how bad your pitch was the first time. <laughs> 
I don't even know if he was in the room. I don't think he was because he was still a part of Frederator at the time. And now he's got his own thing going on. So I don't think I pitched to him. But um, regardless, what you said about like people that you're too scared to pitch to, I don't have that. I think this is what's really worked for me too, is that I don't have that kind of like, like blocker that's like, I don't know if I should email this person because I'm so nervous about them. Or I I don't know if I should approach this person because like they're so cool or good. And like, you're just like, I'm on top. I'm pitching everybody. (laughs) No, I don't even feel that good about myself. Like I I have like a very deteriorating like self image where I need to work on my own confidence levels. But when I'm in like a public place or if I have like a passion project that I want someone to hear about for some reason, it's just like this impulsive, like send, send the email. Don't even read it over. Just, just give it a, just, just, just send it. I wish I had that. I have like super, I I have that in different things. Like I can jump on a podcast and talk with anybody, no problem. But as soon as I'm pitching an idea, I'm like, I'm like this weird sense of like embarrassed, don't want to push it. And like, I downplay everything to the point where it's like, I'm like massively underselling it. That's why practicing and practicing in front of other people helps me so much because it, it forces me to like bring out those qualities that will actually sell the idea versus like, I don't know, which I'm going off on a tangent, but it's weird because I have a marketing background and all I was doing was uh, marketing and creating SEO and writing about and advertisements for products. And I had no problem, you know, um, like (laughs) pimping anything out to the max you know, there's like a little benefit, we're gonna blow it up. And it's, it's the main feature. But when it comes to animation, it's so personal to me that I'm like, I'm so I I haven't figured out how to market my own ideas in a way that comes across as confidence. I I don't think you you really like this. Bye. (laughs) I don't think that changes. I think what I'm saying, I, I feel similarly to you where when it comes to marketing my own work, um, I'll never be like, I'll never go up to someone and be like, I have the best idea in the whole world. Get this. Yeah. Um, that's not me. Like I, I know what, like, I don't know who could, who has that kind of confidence. I, I certainly don't, but I think the confidence I'm talking about is this like YOLO attitude where I'm like, you know, what's, what's going to help me if this email sits in my drafts folder for three or four or five days yeah, or weeks. Okay. Or, like, I don't even, I don't know uh, what I, <laughs> funny, funny story, not related. I think you're going to like the story keep it in the podcast or not. Um, <laughs> when I was at Sheridan, I was like realizing I wanted to be a storyteller and a showrunner and blah, blah, blah. So I emailed a woman called Kimberly Mooney, um, who, when I went to a Gravity Falls talk, I went to a lot of talks, you know, how everyone Sheridan goes to these conferences. Um, I went to this one for Gravity Falls where Michael Rianda was speaking about being a producer and after the show, I was like one of those keeners. I like gunned it to the front. I was like, Michael Rianda, I like want to be a showrunner. What should I do? Like, I have a show idea or whatever I was talking about. And he's like, well, the person you should talk to is Kimberly Mooney because she is uh, development whatever at Disney. And I was like, because he was at Disney at Gravity Falls at the time. So I'm like, oh, okay, Kimberly Mooney. Like, I'm going to go to her. Like, fucking like exact development at Disney, like 23, four-year-old me, second year Sheridan, whatever. So like, (laughs) maybe it was just dumb, but I Facebook messaged her. I found her on Facebook and the gall, the Facebook message, a development exec at whatever, how old I was. I was like, Kimberly Mooney, I was told by Michael Rianda that you're the person I should talk to. I have a show in my third, (laughs) it was my third year film this like terrible shitty like group film and I was like I want to make this a show it's called Camp Nightmare and we're like a group of 10 people how does that work like if we're 10 people we want to sell a show like I want to sell my show to Disney (laughs) and she didn't respond of course right she didn't respond didn't even see the message it's probably still sitting in her unread spam (laughs) wait wait for this oh wait for this five years later almost six, I want to say five or six years later, I get an email or a Facebook, I get a Facebook message from Kimberly Mooney, who's like, hey, is it too late? Um, Sorry, this was sitting in my, like, like my folder of like, um, spam or whatever, like, unread messages from people you don't know. She's like, so sorry, I didn't respond to you. Is it too late? Do you want to talk? Do you still have a nice idea? And I was like, Kimberly Mooney, it's been five years. Are you serious? <laughs> I love that. 
this. Anyway, she's lovely. We had a great conversation. I pitched her lost and found. She loved it. I love her. We talked on and off. Um, it's been a while because of my wedding and all the things that came up in my life, but just do it, people. If whoever's listening, if you have someone you want to talk to, just Facebook message them out of the blue and be very nice about it. Maybe they totally. won't respond to you, but in five years, they might hey, respond back. <laughs> I'm all for that. How do you think I get half the people on my podcast on? I'm like, I want you on. I'm sending you a tweet. I'm sending you an Instagram DM. I'm finding your website. Like I'm sending Sam. info at studio.com. Hey, can I chat with this person? <laughs> but You're also, uh, Ryan also, from Woke on The Office. Go on. Yeah. Also, what you said, I think is really interesting too. Like, and it, it like, um, it kind of, so I'm always like, how can I turn this into a show and pitch it as a show? What is everybody working on a group film or a thesis film at Sheridan should think of their film as a, if they want to, a pitch idea and pitch it. Why not? You're already spending a year creating the assets, the animation tests, a storyboard, a story characters. Why not? Like, so for me, um, like with Silly Duck Wizard, I was like, how can I turn this into something bigger? I'm doing it anyways. And now look, like, you know, things are, things are rolling it's with you. that. You're a showrunner already. I'm a showrunner already. <laughs> you direct everything. You're exactly Hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> but like, you know, you don't have to think about what you're doing here and now in this space of what it's supposed to be like, oh, this is a school assignment supposed to teach me things. No, you're going to do this anyways. Think bigger picture, I guess. I mean, that's not the best advice for everybody. No, if- suppose like, like I, my film was my grandmother surviving the Holocaust. I'm not going to go to Guru and be like, let's make this a show. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Uh, Teen girl living in Hungary, show. 1945. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, maybe. <laughs> I mean, why not? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I think that anyone who's producing anything in fourth year, if you're spending a year on it and you want to do this for a living or you want to make stuff happen for you, you know, produce it as like a promo. Like that's kind of something that I wish I had thought of. Actually, I'm, I'm really happy I went with my thesis film idea. But if I were to redo it, I feel like I would have made the promo or the demo for my show. Yeah, totally. Same time you're young, you don't know that much, you don't know what they're looking for, you might just, I don't know. You- but at the same time, if you have that, if you treat it like that, you will start to talk to the to people who will lead you in a better direction. Like if you're like, hey, props at Sheridan, I want to use my thesis film as, an, as a pilot promo for a bigger project, then people will start to say, oh, you know, like keep it a thesis film. But if you're thinking about pitching, maybe talk to these people, read these resources, look at these, whatever, and it might change. So, yeah. I, I agree. And um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I don't like remember. we're just talking about everything and nothing. <laughs> Speaking of Sheridan, I teach a class. Let's talk about that. Yeah, what up? <laughs> okay. You teach a class at Sheridan. I mean, I, I also want to I also don't want to take your whole night. I know we've been t- chatting for a while. Okay. I feel like you have a lot of editing to do. I'm not gonna edit this at all. I'm not even gonna edit the parts that <laughs> we're coming. No, that's part of it. And people who aren't watching this on YouTube are just gonna have to deal with the 30 seconds of silence while your dog is eating your face and wonder <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> Okay, well, is there anything, any last words that you wanted to end on for anybody listening who? I think you put it pretty good when you said about the fourth year uh, thesis being something you could use um, potentially later on. I mean, I did come up with my Melrose School idea in third year. I didn't use it as a thesis project, but I did do um, a portfolio piece at Sheridan, which was, was that my main character, I rigged him and I walked him onto the stage in front of a microphone and I had him like he was going to do like a, a guitar solo for a talent show. And then I had my friend DJ like say this line that was like, uh, you know what? I can't do this. What was I thinking? How can my mom let me do this? Like, what does she know? Like, I'm not cut out for this. And then he just like walked off stage carrying his guitar behind him. And I thought it was a really interesting like build up to him, like about to like play this guitar. And then it cuts and he's like, I can't do this. What are you talking about? This is so not me. And I was like, this resonated with me because like, I feel like that's very much my sense of humor and like who I am. And um, I used it in my pitch yes. for Melrose, yes. like during Ottawa and at every Melrose pitch meeting I had with all these studios. 
And everyone really connected to that piece because it kind of was like one tiny little thing that was animated already that gave you a sense of like totally. one. And I really wish that I had more time and I could put together like a storyboard or a promo or like more animation on the side. But, you know, if you can do that, like what you did, you did like a 30 second promo piece basically for Silly Duck Wizard. And obviously that would get picked up because you did have to work instead of like, I swear it's going to be good. Read yeah, the right? script. I swear I'm funny. Read my Bible. Like <laughs> they don't know. So. No, a hundred percent. If I, I mean, like I, animation is like a visual storytelling medium and you know, you can sell ideas based on scripts or art, but for me, it's like, if you have the opportunity to create something that you think is going to be, what is your envisioning? Like if you, I don't know, are an animator, can hire an animator, whatever, then it is so much better to just, just show somebody instead of tell them, like just show somebody what a moment is going to be like, versus like, okay, he's going to walk up to the stage. He's going to be really nervous. Um, he's going to take a moment and he's going to say this line, like, there's a totally different experience of just showing somebody that clip, which I, I love that you did. So, yeah. Yeah. I wish I had more of that. Um, that's something I regret is not doing more like art animation. Oh no, don't regret anything. It was a learning experience. Yeah, I mean, I did. Yeah. I got it. I got it picked up. And, and honestly, I feel like they're taking a really big chance and risk on me and my partner. And I'm so grateful for them because I'm just going to do everything in my power to make this like the best. But that is exactly why they're probably taking the risk on you because you are going to do everything in your power versus somebody being like, Oh, cool. I made this thing. My ego's huge. Like whatever. It's going to be great. But you're like, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to put my ass and my heart into this, both of those parts of my body. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm netting zero dollars right now. So <laughs> I'm like, I'll work for free. No, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Taking advantage of you. Okay. Was well, there anything else you wanted to, to end off on? No, but I think what you're doing is pretty cool. And I'm actually so happy that we're actually talking. I feel like this is the longest conversation we've had. And I'm like, there you go. I know we've chatted so randomly over the years. And I've hounded you to come on this podcast many times. <laughs> I'm like grateful that you like still wanted to talk to me yeah. three years later. I remember when I won Ottawa, you were like, we should talk about Ottawa. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I got something in the works right now. Like once it's signed, I'll let you know. Like little did I know it's going to be two years of a development well, process. Well, here we are two years later. Anyways, I hope I also, you know, fingers crossed, maybe you feel the same. I think it'd be really cool to work with you and also your uh, husband, Noam, because I just love the work you do. And it Directors like- Directors collective. It Canada. sits on the same vibe as like where I, I just like animation that I love, you know, like there's like Disney polished animation, but I'm all about like, give me the cute stylized, some butts, crazy eyes uh just fun times animation yeah he's wonderful <laughs> he should be on your podcast People let's do it, it. <laughs> he's up next <laughs> all right, well, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast ali it was absolute absolute pleasure to have you i'm so happy oh, thanks. You're finding i'm so happy to connect yeah and if you're listening and you want to reach out to ali or get in touch with her or check out her pitches on her website you can do so by uh, going to alikellner.com or checking out her instagram which is just ali.kellner and I'll include both those links in the description of this chat. And thank you so much for listening. That's all for now. Goodbye. The music for this podcast was composed by Will Farmer and the graphics by Daniel Abensauer. I encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work.